Alfonso will embrace it, but I wouldn't. I'd be personally crushed if it turned out that it's all the same everywhere in this whole damn universe. Uh, but that's a nice segue to the next talk. Uh, Morgan Cable from uh, JPL, uh, and she is involved in just about every planetary mission I've ever seen. Her name is somewhere in the roster. Uh, she's all over the solar system, but today she's going to focus on Titan, and there we might find a second genesis. Nobody we're related to lives in liquid methane. Morgan. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you today. And I'm going to be talking about one of the New Frontiers uh, mission concepts that was selected to uh, move into step two. And hopefully I will convince you by the end of this that Titan does not belong down in the corner with Mars, but actually further up um, in its own right as an ocean world. So uh, Dragonfly, as I said, is one of these New Frontiers mission concepts. PI is Zibby Turtle out of APL. Um, I'm a co-I as well as a few others in the room, uh, Chris and Kevin Hand. Um, and there's a big team, but I'll show you that later on. Okay. 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 Next, please. Oh, wait. What happened? Okay. Hold on. Can you go back to, please? I swear I'm hitting the button. Okay, let's just, that's great. Okay, so two of the main questions that Dragonfly aims to answer focus on habitability and, yes, life. And Titan turns out to be one of the ideal places to do this type of test. It's essentially a prebiotic laboratory on a planetary scale. So for those of you who don't live and breathe Titan, this is the largest moon of Saturn. It's the second largest moon in the solar system, but if you count its atmosphere, it is actually the biggest. Titan's atmosphere is one and a half times thicker than Earth's in terms of pressure at the surface. It's nitrogen rich, just like ours, uh, but it does have a significant amount of methane and it is much colder considering how far away we are uh, from the sun here in orbit around Saturn. Now, in its atmosphere, it's mostly nitrogen, N2, and methane, CH4. And you get UV radiation. There are highly charged or fast-moving particles that are accelerated by Saturn, protons and electrons that slam into these two molecules and essentially ionize and otherwise break them apart. So for those of you who have your chemistry sets at home, is anyone? I'm a, I'm a chemist. Good. All right. So if you were to try to come up with any kind of molecule that involved those three atoms, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and put it together, whether it's small, whether it's big, if it's got double bonds, single bonds, triple bonds, whatever, it probably exists in the atmosphere of Titan and ends up, especially the big ones, precipitating down on the surface. So in terms of looking at life, well, we have, we have energy through sunlight and also this photochemistry that's happening in the atmosphere. We have a ton of organic molecules, pretty much anything you can think of, that is raining down on the surface. And now we get to the really interesting part, the solvents. Now, everyone talks about Titan as this fascinating place because it's got hydrocarbons. It has liquid methane and ethane on the surface. And I agree, that's really cool, that's amazing. But people forget, Titan is an ocean world too. It's got a liquid water, global ocean just like Enceladus or Europa, underneath all of the cool stuff that's happening on the surface. So Titan kind of gives us two cool things to test in one, right? We can look for aqueous-based life, or at least the precursors for that life, life as we know it. But then we can also investigate this unique solvent, this nonpolar solvent that's made up of hydrocarbons, and look for life as we don't know it. And hopefully Steve Benner and a few of the others that are coming later in the session today can add to that discussion. So Titan is a really fascinating place for us to try to search for these things, to understand what it takes for a world or a planet, a moon, to be habitable in those two different contexts, aqueous-based and not, and what chemical processes might have led to the development of life. So Carolyn talked a lot about Cassini, which is near and dear to my heart as well. I was involved in that mission near the end, and it was an incredible team, it made some amazing discoveries. It's one of the reasons why we understand Titan as well as we do today, but it did leave some unanswered questions. And specifically for Titan, one of those unanswered questions was composition, at least of the surface. Because the atmosphere is so dense, it has haze layers, methane absorbs really strongly, especially in the near infrared. And so we were only able to get hints of composition of the surface by 
peering through certain what we call methane windows. They're places where these molecules don't absorb very strongly and we can see all the way to the surface. And in doing so, we can get some guesses about some of the cool things that we see on the surface. For example, in the equatorial regions of Titan, we see these dunes. We're pretty sure they're organic rich. That's about as far as our knowledge goes. We don't know what organics those are made of. In situ measurements will really help address that problem, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, based on just the density of Titan, we know that the, the crust has to be made of water ice, just like Enceladus, Europa, a lot of these other icy moons, these ocean worlds. Um, and we see some places on the surface where it looks like that ice is exposed. The rest of it is covered up in sort of this veneer of organic material. And we also see the Cassini uh, Visible and Infrared Mapping Spectrometer, or VINs, did show some regions that were bright in the five micron region or of the spectrum, which makes us believe that they might have been formed by some sort of evaporitic process. Now, in my laboratory at uh, JPL, I and colleagues have been trying to understand from a chemistry standpoint, from an experimental standpoint, what that stuff could be made of. And so we make mini Titan lakes in the lab, we dissolve organic molecules in there, and then observe what forms when that liquid evaporates away. And one of the cool things that we're finding is that there are associations. Molecules co-crystallize. They form what we're terming organic minerals, things that behave in a similar way to what you know, silicates and other types of minerals here on Earth do. But here, the phases are made up of organic molecules. The point is, we're, even when we just mix two things together, not even the you know, many millions of probably different organic molecules that exist on Titan together, we're starting really simple, and we're still getting surprised. So in situ data will really help us validate those measurements that we're making in the lab to understand Titan as a system. So, okay, Titan is really amazing. It's got different, um, compositionally, what appear to be different places on the surface. Now, let's say you want to sample all of those. Well, one potential way that you could do that is by designing multiple landers to go to different places. That's great. Is NASA going to fund us to spend a whole bunch of money on multiple landers to go to this place? Maybe not. Um, instead, it might make more sense to have one platform that's mobile, right, that has your instrument suite that you want to use to interrogate the surface and then just move that from place to place. That also eliminates some um, sort of biases in terms of calibration of the instrument. If you're using the same instrument, the exact same instrument, and just moving that from place to place. So that argues for some kind of a mobile platform. Okay, well, Titan, it ends up being perfect for something like this because the gravity is less and the atmosphere is denser than Earth. And I love saying this. So if you were standing on the surface of Titan and you had wings and you flapped them, you could fly. Like, it's that easy. Like, you could do it. So we're pretty sure <laughs> that we can design something that could do that, too. And so we think that this is something that's feasible. And we're not the only ones, obviously. There have been many studies. There's a rich history of designing and coming up with uh, concepts and strategies for either staying airborne in Titan and just continuously sampling, um, or some type of balloon system or something where you can still be mobile, or a combination of some sort of aerial platform and then a lander. And all that we've essentially done with Dragonfly is combine those two strategies into one, right? We have a lander, but we are also able to move said lander. Um, using the, um, this type of um, aerial technology, using essentially a drone, which turns out to be very stable, much more stable than just a single-bladed helicopter. So yes, we want to send a quadcopter, actually an octocopter, uh, to Titan. So this enables sampling at multiple locations. We can get context, which is really, really important, especially if we're trying to understand a complex system like Titan, where we've got, we have you know, dunes, we have rain events happening, there are rivers and channels that have been etched in the, the surface, we see lakes at the poles. We think that there might be some sort of subsurface like aquifer, they call it an alkanifer, alkanifer because it's alkanes instead of liquid water. We, we have fun naming things. Um, but the point is that there are really complex processes going on, and so to put this in context, being able to you know, essentially take a step back, look from the air, and put this into um, a global perspective, or at least a regional perspective in terms of your understanding, is really important. Oh, and understanding this from a human scale. That's one other thing I wanted to bring up. I forgot. Um, raise your hand if you've been to space. I know there at least, okay. So you guys, you can take orbital, 
like an orbital image of Titan, right, and put it into context. But the rest of us, that might be a little bit harder. But I imagine almost all of you probably took a plane flight to get here, right? So you're used to seeing things from that type of context. And of course, standing and observing something. This would be, you know, about the average height of a person, you could imagine. So being able to put this into a context that we all can understand is critical as well. Okay, so Dragonfly is a dual quadcopter. I like octocopter better personally, but it's a dual quadcopter rotorcraft, uh, would be. Uh, were it to be selected, we really hope that it makes it all the way through and we end up getting back to Titan in my lifetime. That would be awesome. The payload includes a mass spectrometer that we call DRAMS that is capable of getting that critical in situ chemical compositional information we need to be able to understand what is physically present on the surface of Titan. It's got a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, so that gives us some bulk measurements of the composition of the surface. We've got a meteorology package. This is something that can operate on the ground and also when we're airborne in flight. And then, of course, a camera suite, which is important for obtaining context. Uh, this would be powered by uh, multi-mission RTGs that then charge a battery, uh, which is what we would use when we were in flight. And it's got direct to Earth communication. So with this payload, we would be able to look at the, the chemical components, the, the processes to try to get at some of those mechanisms of how two simple molecules, nitrogen and methane, can form all of the rich organic material that appears to be present on the surface. We can constrain processes that mix these organics, potentially pull them down into that subsurface liquid water ocean that everyone keeps forgetting about. If we make these materials in the lab, we call them tholins. Actually, Carl Sagan coined the term. It comes from the Greek tholos, which means uh, dim or not clear, because they're sort of dim and muddy colored, but they're also, we don't know what they're made of. So not, I, I love Carl Sagan. Anyway, um, <laughs> but when we dissolve those in liquid water, they make amino acids, like just, they. There they are. So if we are able to move this organic material down into that liquid water ocean, just imagine what is possible. Uh, let's see, what am I missing? Um, so we would be able to, like I said, for each, each place where Dragonfly lands, be able to perform this detailed chemical analysis. Uh, the mass spectrometer is heritage from SAM. It would also be able to get at some of these life questions of prebiotic or potentially biotic chemistry. Uh, Alfonso was also mentioning that uh, amino acid, the chirality measurement, that's something that we can do. Uh, let's see, anything else here? Oh, in flight, be able to get um, atmospheric profiles, things like temperature, diurnal and spatial variations to help us understand how Titan is, is evolving over time, and aerial imagery for that context. So getting at habitability and the life question, we can look not only for life as we know it, but life as we don't. And mass spectrometers are, are one of those wonderful instruments that are agnostic to those types of measurements, right? We can search for those fatty acid patterns that Alfonso mentioned. We can search for uh, chirality differences, but we can also look for things that we can't predict yet. Based on the complexity of the organic molecules that are present on Titan, there may be some other formation mechanism that still generates a pattern, some pattern that is different from if you just had abiotic things going on. And when we have in situ data, we can then take that back to the modelers, to people like myself in the laboratory, and do those experiments and really see if this is something that is unique to life, if it's that hypothesis of last resort, or if it is just another abiotic system. So the timeline is, if we're selected, a launch in 2025, arrival at Titan in 2034. Uh, the plan is to land in the equatorial region in those organic rich dunes uh, because they're very well characterized by Cassini radar. We have a very good understanding of uh, their heights, their distributions, their spacings, and we believe that this is a place that we can land safely and then proceed to essentially hop around uh, as we uh, explore the different and varied environments that are on Titan. Uh, the current mission plan is for two years of exploration, um, but we could presumably go for longer, covering trains over tens to hundreds of kilometers. So this is a day in the life of Dragonfly, a Titan Sol, if you will, which is 16 Earth days. So th the other nice thing about this kind of strategy is we can leverage all of that experience that we have from Mars rovers, where mission ops would be very similar, right? We start off by downlinking data, uplinking direction from the science team, 
Then we can do weather measurements, essentially like a pre-flight checklist, like if any pilots are in the room. Same kind of thing, making sure that the situation is safe for us to be able to, to do a takeoff. Then we do a flight profile and a landing site assessment. So the idea is we would think two steps ahead. So we take off, go and survey the place where we would presumably land next, come back, analyze that data, and then by, before we even go and land there, we're already looking at the next site, site C, if you will. Uh, so we're always thinking multiple steps ahead, um, but we're never landing in a place where we haven't fully assessed it, gone back to the previous one, and made sure that the science team and uh, the mission ops specialists have been able to get a really good assessment of that. Um, we'll be doing bulk measurements, in situ measurements on the ground, and then as I said, when we're airborne, be able to get uh, context measurements and also keep that uh, meteorology package going. Uh, let's see, what else? At night, that would be the overnight and recharge of the battery. We ha would bring some LEDs around or with us because there are certain organic molecules, in particular uh, benzene and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, that are fluorescent. And that can be another tool that can help us really glean that compositional information that we want that is so critical for understanding Titan as a system. Uh, we've got an amazing team. I feel so lucky to be a part of this. I think it's a really fantastic mission concept. I want to remind everyone that NASA dares mighty things. This is what we do, and I think this is a critical step for us to both reach out to the outer planets and try something amazing, something that no one's ever done before. I mean, we have the technology. We can do this. We know we can do this. So let's, let's just do it, because it's amazing. And I'll, I'll stop here, and I'd be happy to take questions. Is there time for questions? Yes, one more. Mm. What's the weather like on Titan, and would that affect operation of the, uh, the drone? That's an excellent question. The weather actually looks pretty benign on Titan. So we have some measurements based on uh, essentially wind ripple effects in the poles of observing the specular reflection of the Titan lakes. So that can give us some estimates of wind speeds and at most, they're on the order of like a meter per second for very gusty conditions. Most of them are, are much lower than that. We also, at least based on the lifetime of the Cassini mission, which was 13 years, we looked for movements in the dunes to see if the dunes boom, um, as it were, or shift. And we haven't seen any of those shifts, which would also indicate that either the material is cemented down, or if it's loose, that the winds aren't substantial enough to move it around. Um, but we do see around some features something that looks wind blown. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be significant enough. And we've, we've done a lot of assessments to be sure that this type of platform would be stable. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, if the place is absolutely just seething with life, you'll find all these um, uh, sort of asymmetrical distributions of different chiralities and uh, weights. But if it's kind of not so hospitable, it's going to be pretty hard to pick the signal from the noise. What are your thoughts about that? You're right, and that's a question that we need to consider with all of these ocean worlds. Uh, what if life is just gaining a foothold, for example, in the ocean of Enceladus or Europa? Uh, at some point, if there's like one cell there, we're not going to detect it, right? That's, that's really, really impossible. Not impossible, it's very, very hard. Um, so we, we have to, any time that we go and we ask these big questions, there are going to be, you know, is there a detection? Yes. If there's not, it's going to be down to a certain limit of detection. And that's all we can say is that it's not there at this level. But we don't know whether or not it would be below that. Um, we, we won't know unless we look. And I don't think we've looked hard enough yet. And I think many of you would agree. So we're, all we can do is bring the best payload with the technology we have and get it to the place that we think is most likely. And that's what we aim to do. But there are some very interesting things about Titan. We see this hydrogen flux that is a little bit weird. We don't see as much acetylene on the surface as we would expect. And there are some microorganisms that actually metabolize um, acetylene. So there are some people that would argue there might already be some preliminary evidence for some type of metabolism going on. Um, I think that we need to go and verify that with more in situ measurements with this. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.